hej och välkomna till detta avsnitt av Djungelpodden. Jag heter Leo Edin och jag är som vanligt dagens programledare. Idag så har jag två stycken väldigt spännande gäster med mig från Blekinge Tekniska Högskola, Dr. Tony Gorsek och Dr. Daniel Mendes Fernandes som båda kommer att prata lite om sitt arbete som de gör. Den här gången så kommer avsnittet att vara på engelska. Det kommer också finnas tillgängligt på Youtube. Jag hade med mig dessa två här på länk från Blekinge och vi spelade in det så att man hellre har rörlig bild då går man helt enkelt bara in på Youtube och söker efter Olingo där. Avsnitten finns också på olingo.se och där kan ni hitta inspelade webbinar och annat bra matnyttigt som vi bjuder på. Men nog om det, här kommer podden. Welcome to the podcast. Um, to the, we're back after the pandemic. Today we have very two very distinguished guests, um, and today we're coming for you for the first time ever in English. So we're very happy about that. Uh, please help me give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Tony Gorsek and uh, Dr. Daniel Mendes Fernandes, both from uh, Blekinge Tekniska Högskola. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. How are you today? Is this your first uh, time on a podcast? Yeah, I, maybe. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yeah, not for me, but it's still weird. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yes. No, we. I, I think we're in our home arena, which means we're kind of comfortable and relaxed in the sofa, and we're not awake enough yet to be scared. So it's fine. <laughs> no, that's good. Perfect. Perfect um, mindset then. Uh, Tony, we're going to start with you. Could you just, just uh, give us a short introduction to, to who are you and what sort of work uh, do you do? Sure. So I'm a professor here at BTH in uh, the Searle Group, which is a software engineering research lab. I work primarily as a research scientist and a, and a leader uh, of several projects. And most of the work I do, I do together with the company partners. So. Um, Basically, what we do is, as a team, we try to identify challenges, long-term challenges, and then try to solve them uh, um, together and find the researchable kernel and then look at how can we be the engine of research for the companies and do stuff they don't have time for, mm. and at the same time do uh, stuff which is relevant for them and researchable. Uh, and that's a very interesting challenge. Mm. Interesting. Uh, we're going to go, go uh, deeper into that subject. But first, uh, Daniel, welcome you as well. Uh, tell us about yourself. Thank you very much. So I'm as well a professor for software engineering, uh, a colleague of Tony at the same group. Uh, and next to that, I'm heading a small research group at uh, Fortis. It's a research and transfer institute in Munich, a public one, nonprofit research institute. And I joined BTH uh, two years ago now, and uh, I would say found my home, professionally <laughs> speaking, <laughs> found my home. And, and yeah, before that I was um, at the Technical University of Munich, and, uh, but we might be ending up talking about that and why I changed. <laughs> and um, primarily what research philosophy actually I think that we all share which is also one of the main reasons I came here at the very end mm. but yeah thank you very much for having us both so uh, tell me a little bit about, about uh, Blekinge Tekniska Högskola I'm going to start referring to it as BTH uh, yeah. what sort of research is going on there you mentioned software is there anything else yeah I mean so BTH is the smallest uh, technical university in Sweden mm -hmm. I think still think so actually and i like that because it's kind of a startup and mm -hmm. uh, more of a startup than most universities which is kind of cool and we do a lot of things here but much less than most universities because we're more focused more profiled so we do computer science software engineering healthcare um, and uh, sustainability and and engineering in general uh, and it's very focused on applied sciences right mm -hmm. so so uh, nothing wrong with all types of science it's just that our speciality is working with the, the people who use the stuff we develop right so so we work very closely with companies and most of our funding is from companies uh, and funding agencies and but it's kind of a collaboration between uh, companies and us which is kind of the unique thing uh, normally you don't have that much interaction and and that close of a tie mm. and that's kind of the why i'm here mm. i would say um simply 
because you kind of get the real challenges. And then if you solve the real challenges, you kind of get proof if it works or not in reality, right? And not just in research papers, but actually in reality. And I think that's what keeps me interested, mm. at least. Uh, likewise, if I may add, uh, small or among the smallest universities, small in terms of, yes, university, uh, but in terms of department, I would say among the largest. Yeah. Um, uh, department for Software Engineering, uh, at least. Both of which I consider a strength for research and education. Um, many of the concepts we use in teaching, they do not scale. And it's a big difference uh, having to teach 800 students in one lecture hall uh, and having the privilege, I should say, to teach 30 to 40 students in a lecture hall where you yeah. can really convey certain messages, principles, methods much, much, much better. So in that sense, this is also definitely one of the reasons I like it here so much. Yeah. I think we're, I mean, you're right. I, I think from a, in, in software engineering, which is basically everything and anything related to software intensive products yeah. and services. So think about a car, but also think about the information system. So the water that comes out of your tap is controlled by computer systems in some way to pure software. I mean, anything related, that's kind of software engineering. Mm -hmm. And we're probably the largest, one of the largest yeah. or the largest software yeah. engineering group in Sweden but at a fairly small university. And I think that combination makes it flexible and, and adaptive, mm -hmm. um, which means that we can work much closer to industry partners uh, when we're solving problems, which is kind of unique uh, compared to many other universities who have other strengths, of course, more mm -hmm. base science, right? So there's no, uh, we're better or worse. It's just, we're specialized in this and we like that. And, and uh, that's kind of the road. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier uh, that you were working with applied sciences, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about the word applied. Is, is all research and science not applicable? What what's, separates you from the rest? <laughs> That's a touchy <laughs> subject. <laughs> How many people do you want to make angry? No. So I would say this, um, uh, they, they are, uh, th this is a big subject, and we're research scientists, which means that we, we can discuss this for hours. But keep it simple. What do you say about this definition? If you, can use, if you can solve a problem and use the solution, scientifically achieved solution within five to 10 years, mm -hmm. and it's actually used in industry and not something that's theoretically maybe going to be used in 50 years, then I would say it's applied. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of base the problem at company sites and then try the solutions once it's devised at the company and you collect data if it works or not at the company, then I would say it's applied. Is that a reasonable definition? Definitely. I think one, one key element to applied research is listening to practical problems and trying to focus on solving them. And to a certain extent, this also means that you as a researcher need to jump over your own shadow, I would say. Mm. Um, very often, we, we have many great colleagues uh, in the research community uh, who hum somehow stick to certain, let's say, research flavors. Uh, one example is formalization or yeah. formal methods. Yeah. So formal methods have a certain strength. Everything has its place in software engineering and, and formal methods, um, for example, in terms of quality assurance model checking, for example, has its place in a larger picture. But sometimes I have the feeling that many of these colleagues just formalize for the sake of formalization yeah, because, because they learn to do it, they do it but they don't really listen to, to practical problems. One small anecdote, if I may, yeah. just very, very quick anecdote. Um, when I, so I studied computer science, the more traditional computer mm -hmm. science and, and cognitive neuroscience, which was back then a, something to compensate. I wanted to go for robotics originally and before I learned better. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and uh, I was at a software engineering uh, research uh, chair, um, which I appreciated and still do a lot but uh, one of the core philosophies was formalization, uh, formalizing everything. And I remember that uh, back then, the rise of agile methods, uh, one of my seminar topics I had uh, was to apply process algebra to formalize agile methods. And I was always wondering why. So why? And I've, I've never, sometimes you just, you know, need to leave that ivory tower to a certain extent yeah. and look at from a certain humble perspective, maybe what the actual problems are. And we still apply scientific research methods mm. very much indeed, 
apply a, a scientific uh, elaborate research method, but with the primary aim to solve practically relevant, uh, I would say, at least uh, problems, uh, short term, mid term, and also long term, yeah. of course. I would say that uh, I, I see it like this. If I'm really good at using a hammer, right? Mm -hmm. Then everything looks like a nail, right? And I would say the hardest thing about applied science and being a good researcher, in my perspective, is abandoning the tools you're really good at when they're not relevant for the problem. Mm. Uh, so, so, and, and, and one more thing is when we go out and work with our partners, we generally get symptoms, right? So people tell, oh, we have a problem with this. Well, generally that's a symptom. So one of the most important jobs is kind of look at the root cause, right? So kind of figure out what the root cause of the issue is or the challenge is, because that's generally what we do research on. While the symptoms are important to fix today, maybe, but they're not really solutions long term. So that's kind of kind of a, a reasonable summary. Identify the real problems, mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out, okay, how can we solve them? And not being married to a specific solution, but rather looking at the problem as the focus instead of what I know as a solution package. Mm -hmm. And that's hard as a researcher yeah. because you get really good at certain solutions. Yeah. And it's very tempting to try to use the same solutions over and over again, right? Because it's less work. Plus, plus to add to the challenges, uh, we need, of course, still to keep a certain balance between, you know, purely applied research and making sure that we have also certain theoretical relevance. So practical relevance is not the sole, it's what drive, drives us, but it's definitely not the sole measure of success. No. To a certain extent, this is, I think, one of the challenges to keep the balance between what is really theoretically relevant and what is practically relevant. Yep. And this is the stress field we're moving. And there is a conflict, which is a good and a bad thing. The conflict in science is that on the one hand, you have a delivery process for scientific venues, which means peer review and structure mm. and, 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 and quality assurance and control. On the other hand, you have a delivery system or a need by, by industry partners to get solutions that work. And one doesn't necessarily care about the other. And one of the coolest challenges I like is try to solve a real problem in reality and at the same time make it make it scientifically valid, right? Because then you get the benefit of both. Then the, the people in the industry get a validation or they get the confirmation that it's actually peer reviewed and, and not just consultancy, if you will. Not that consultancy is bad, it's just that it's not science, right? It's a solution, but we kind of have the scientific backing if we do it well. And then on the other side, also the scientific part gets backing from application and reality, right? So you can collect yeah. data from real companies when they mm. use your solution. Mm. And if you can do this correctly, which is very hard and time consuming, I think it's the best of both worlds. I think so too. I think so too. Much of what we do, I think, in an ideal world is also transfer. So how can we transfer theoretical concepts to practical ends? Mm. So one simple example. Um, we know we have a, we see a symptom in a company that there are certain communication deficiencies. So, uh, for a long time, uh, globally distributed development was always a thing, a de facto standard. So people have always been working to a certain extent remotely, communicating with offshore development and so on and so forth. And so, a symptom is that that we might have some bottlenecks. So. One practical solution could be that we try to visualize communication networks and we try to find out, are there any, let's say, are there any patterns? Are there any, is there anything observable that we can improve? And the theoretical concept we apply there is actually a graph theoretical problem. So it's a mathematical problem to mm. a certain extent. So we apply graph theory to solve this problem. Of course, we don't talk with our industry partners typically about these graph theoretical problems but what we do is we develop ourselves first prototypes first tools that rely on those graph theoretical problems and challenges and we we test and we talk about those tools as a means to an end to yeah. solve those specific problems and this gives us both this gives us some good insights into how we can transfer these these more theoretical concepts mm -hmm. but uh, it gives us also the benefit of, of having an immediate industry validation mm -hmm. Of solving a certain problem and this is the stress field we mentioned before i mean for me personally since i don't have to play the game as much now and as yeah. as when i was younger and starting out for me a success criteria is literally 
if I if I solve a problem or my team doesn't, I say me, but we're a bunch of really good people. So so just assume I'm talking about the team, right? But it, but if we kind of solve a, a problem and we transfer it and try it out in reality, and then we leave, and then a year later we come back and they're still using the solution mm -hmm. without us, that's successful from an industry perspective. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, our ultimate goal is to kind of have solutions that work without us and are mm -hmm. worth investing in so that because they actually solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not easy. I think, uh, it's, I think it's a really interesting aspect, the fact that you're working so closely with the industries. And I, th I imagine it sets you apart from a lot of other different institutions. So I was just curious, why did you choose to go this route? How did you end up, like, why did you uh, decide to connect so with the industries? So, well, it's arrogant to say, uh, yeah, it was, you know, we decided. No, I, I think it's an evolution. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, there was a very long time where, where research was uh, slightly too theoretical to be applicable fast. Mm -hmm. um, and there were many problems in industry that were kind of solved theoretically, but never applied, right? So one of the biggest problems, one of the largest things we do is when we identify a challenge, we kind of look at what's already been done. And many times stuff is semi-solved. Then we kind of massage a already present solution and our contribution is transferring it and making it work in reality, right? So we can actually reuse more base science for our solutions, which is kind of the point, right? We don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why we kind of, it's a good niche and it's a niche that has huge importance and is growing the need for it. And we're still too few working in this way. Mm. That's one thing. And also, I think most of us here are, have worked in industry and work in industry and like working in reality, if you will. Mm -hmm. And here we can kind of do the best of both worlds. I, I can kind of be a person working in industry, but at the same time, not selling hours, right? But I'm selling solutions. And I really like that idea that I can be honest, mm. right? So I, I, can, I, I don't have to play the game, you know, the game of hours or money or politics. I can just be brutally honest and, and nice, of course, but still honest. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I like that from a sanity perspective, for me at least, yeah. because I like solving problems. I like working with tough challenges in reality. And I like to see if my stuff works or not. Mm. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I think that's kind of uh, a nice summary of why it's cool to work here. I think so too. And I think that all of us at the department have a very different background, but we all share a certain set of commonalities, which is exactly this evolution that mm. Tony mentioned. For me, it was, I mentioned earlier, I, um, as I said, I was studying computer science in a more theoretically oriented environment, which in retro perspective is great because it gave me the tools or made me understand the tools we still use today. Um, but I missed this direct connection to industry problems. So I did my, my diploma, which is today's equivalent to master's degree at a company, stayed at the company, but this was a little bit too much driven by purely economic factors. I was working mm. in, um, in the avionic sector. And then I got the great opportunity of doing my, my uh, taking a research position at a different university, the technical university. However, my PhD, I did mostly at a company. So I was literally from Monday to Thursday, sitting at a company at the research and development department, department, talking with developers, talking with engineers. And Fridays was my university day, despite being employed by the Technic University. And these first two years of my PhD were for me personally eye-opening, um, leading exactly to this shared set of you know, cherished principles and doing applied research that we still do today. Hmm. And for me, this was the, so in, in South Sweden, this is exactly the environment that I would say gives us these, or unifies everyone based on those hmm. shared uh, principles. Hmm. Yeah. It sounds very exciting. And, and Tony, you are actually the head of a, a project called CERT, uh, which is yes. the way we got in touch with you. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so software engineering rethought is, is kind of the name of it. So the idea is to, so when I did my PhD, there were great people 
uh, supporting me and working applied with industry and 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 uh, and there were I mean uh, Klaus Wilhelm Michael Matson were were kind of the the pioneers in in in, in having the guts really to, to kind of start working with the industry much more than, than was normal. And then we kind of took, took the banner when, when they're kind of handing over the banner and, and we're trying to run with it and do even more applied science, right? Mm. So, so you, it, it's kind of a stage model because traditionally science is very in four doors, which means, or four, four walls, which means that you kind of want to do even more with companies. Um, and I, I think we're running with this. And the third project is kind of the latest, latest iterations of this. And what we're tr really trying to do is identify a number of burning problems, right? Like for example, complexity and size is growing. And at the same time, speed of delivery and flexibility of the companies delivering the products and services needs to be faster. And this per definition doesn't work together, right? And then if you break the problem down in further, you have uh, concepts like asset management uh, or a bad word of that, the technical debt, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it literally is. Um, and then you, but you also have human factors. So how do, you, how do you automate the boring stuff, but actually use people for the things they're best at? Mm -hmm. And you have I mean, just examples. You have uh, sensible automation. So which parts are more expensive to automate than beneficial and vice versa? And there are many of these micro challenges in the big picture mm. and you need to solve them some way. And, and for example, how do you scale agile mm. and how don't you go, I mean, and what are the good stuff about agile and how do you keep them in a large organization without actually destroying it? Uh, so, so all of these, there are maybe 20 of these things we identified as critical long-term. And then we applied for funding from KKS and got it right. Mm. Uh, and we and we have a great team working on multiple of these challenges, and it's literally a span from very very deep theoretical stuff like algorithms for natural language processing mm. and machine learning down to very very human aspects like how do people like to be productive and how do they thrive in a good environment right doing a good job. Mm. And it's a, because you cannot be too focused on, yes, it, it, we need a tool because that's only part of the equation. And the really cool thing about CERT, which is the largest software engineering project in Sweden, is that we have 12 great partners we work with. And they're like from everything from automotive to, to banks. Uh, and, and of course, um, and we work with the Lingo, Time People Group. Um, and all of these things are, are kind of, really cool because we get a bunch of challenges and and possibilities for validating solutions with all of these company partners uh, and and basically there's no prestige that's kind of the cool thing we want to solve problems and transfer the problem solutions as much as possible and the companies don't have to worry about us competing or wanting to sell them something right and i think that's a great dynamic because then the, there's no need to trust me simply because if the solution works and we can prove it works, mm. there's no trust involved, right? And that's kind of a cool concept that you invest only what you invest in terms of implementing solutions you need anyway. So uh, these, these projects you mentioned, did you start with a hypothesis yourself and then, then you started the industry? So did the industry come to you first with their problems? How did it come about? So it came about in a combination, uh, sadly, I can't give you a straight answer to that because it's it was a couple a bunch of years working in smaller projects with industry a lot and everybody was super busy right mm -hmm. and we we felt that we needed to kind of take um, take a big picture view helhets talk in Swedish right uh, and look at okay we're doing solutions in in for certain companies in certain tracks. But there's so much more we can do if we kind of work together and combine these things. Mm. So a bunch of us actually sat down uh, and, and and kind of said, okay, what are the challenges we've observed the last three four years? And we kind of did that work and, as a hypothesis or a bunch of them really, and then we immediately confirmed them with our partners and companies, and we of course modified them and massaged them until we had a really good idea what's the biggest stuff the next 10, 20 years we believe, right? Based on everything we know. 
And that's kind of the embryo for, for, for the application and, and subsequent project. And then the interesting thing is the project, of course, changes while we're doing it, right? Because the world is changing. So if you look at what we said originally in the project, it's the same direction and same point, but the small stuff in terms of exactly what we look at changes because we learn while we're going, right? Yeah. And the partner's challenge has also changed. So there's always change even for us. Uh, and I think that flexibility is important mm. by design. Yeah, I think this is important to understand. Yeah. The project has been designed that way, that we can adopt based in joint discussions uh, with industry partners yeah. and based on their problems that we can adopt. I think Tony mentioned that, I don't know if I have to rephrase, but that we are not married by convenience to certain topics or no. predefined for a set of topics. Mm. And I think this is the core of CERT also yeah. in this project, that we go as we see fit based on research interest and problems we're trying to solve and competencies, of course, that yeah. we have. I think the largest challenge is kind of not allowing, so we I would like to have 40 partners in the CERT project. The problem is it's very, it's a lot of work with 12 partners, right? Mm. Because they, they want, we have too little time to actually solve the problems, even if we're a big team. Mm. So ultimately, my biggest frustration, I would say, not being able to invite more partners and work with more of them. And also um, that the larger project you have, the more coordination there is, yes. right? And that also requires energy and time. It's, it's not that it's difficult or, or, or not fun. It's just that it takes time from the problems solving. Uh, so so it's, it's, it, it's kind of cool. Uh, I mean... I see it as an opportunity for all of us to do relevant work and not chasing stuff, but rather focusing on the problems. I like that a lot. How long would you say these projects are on average? So normal research projects uh, funded is about three years, mm -hmm. uh, but the third project is six to eight years, I would say. A uh, little depending on... Um, ramp up time because one of the largest challenges in any big venture is finding the right people right mm -hmm. uh, because you might imagine that there are a lot of people doing the work but there are sadly radically too few good engineers in the world mm -hmm. and even fewer researchers uh, with the right mindset uh, and and that's a big challenge i would yeah. say our largest challenge is finding excellent people mm. and not because they aren't excellent people it's just that the niche of excellent people is fairly small that want to work close with industry have the right mindset for problem solving and have the right background and and, and we're recruiting anything and everything from all over the world the only thing we care about <laughs> yes tim for example no but we care about being a good problem solver we don't care about anything else mm. uh, and 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 that's not easy. I mean, yeah. we're literally looking for people all the time and hiring everybody who's really good. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we're a really good team with really good people, uh, if I say so myself. And I don't say so because I'm here. I am say so because my colleagues are here. And I, we want to be careful mm. because it's a family, right? And, 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 and that's something to cherish, mm. in my book anyway. And I think just it's not a matter of getting a job here. It's rather becoming a part mm -hmm. of something. And I think that's a big difference, hiring a person for a job versus hiring a person to become part of the team. I think that's fundamentally different. Mm. Uh, uh, sounds Very too fluffy. Sorry. Eloquently put, yeah, this I is would say, Tony. But uh, just okay. uh, Thanks, if, you, <laughs> if we're talking about the nitty-gritty about this project, suppose we were you were starting up a new project um, these coming months. Uh, how does the interaction work between between you and the company you're working with with the industries? How involved are they are they going to be throughout the process? Hmm. That's a good question. So I would say that there are multiple paths. I yeah. think uh, towards that. Um, over the past years, of course, we have established. Um, some uh, let's say more permanent contacts we're working of course with certain people more and more together in the different companies 
So they know how to reach out to us. We know how to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, also to scale up a little bit what we are doing mm -hmm. and increase the visibility of what we are doing. We are also organizing regular seminars, mm -hmm. conferences, to which we invite our partners, but also their partners. So it's mm -hmm. always open. It's always public. Um, I think do good things and talk about this. This is what we do in these seminars. And this helps us also promote some new ideas. Some of those ideas take off and fly, others not, which, yep. is, which is fine. But uh, of course, this is a two-way street. So uh, our partners can approach us as well with, with certain ideas, pain points and think, hey, I would like to try out this or that technology in this or that field. Yep. Uh, can we do this together? And this is what we, what, how we start these discussions, sit together at a table and, and think this through and just uh, do it. And uh, I mean, the response been from from the industries. I would imagine they would op welcome you with open arms, an opportunity like this. <laughs> they do, they do. But yeah. here's the funny thing: if we have an established relationship with a company, they're very, very open and flexible and fast and very fast to react. And actually, that's the problem because the company who knows us, who knows us and works with us, kind of want all bandwidth, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, we'll do that with you. No, no, no problem, right? that makes it also very hard to include new partners because the new partners don't get any oxygen, right? Yeah. Uh, and another thing is when they don't know, so if, if a company don't, doesn't know me, they have no clue about this. And I go to them and say, listen, we'll solve your long-term problems for free. We need access to your people and your data and your products. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and if we solve the problem, you can try the solution and there is no cost involved and no risk. Mm -hmm. Sounds slightly too good to be true, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the problem. Uh, I, I spend like half of the energy introducing a new company, convincing them I'm not trying to rip them off. Mm. Not, not because they, it sounds hard. The point is, it sounds too good, right? I yeah. mean, what's the catch? That, that's immediate. Yeah, yeah, how much do we have to pay you? Well, you don't. You pay in your effort. Mm. Wait a minute. So we do what we do anyway, but then you solve our problems for free? Yes. No, you know, even if they understand it and it's, formally con contractually bound mm -hmm. it's still hard when you come from a, a place where you pay for everything or everybody ev anybody and everybody wants something from you uh, and this is a super great resource in swedish research i would say mm -hmm. in the swedish tradition i know there are others like this but i know sweden mostly and the swedish tradition of doing applied research where the funding comes from significantly from the government or mm. foundations which focuses on the research and not profit it's very hard for most companies to understand the golden position that puts them in mm. right because you can literally have a research department for free in your company by collaborating with the university doing applied research mm. and this is kind of uh, takes a little time to establish this relationship i think so too yeah the relationship and the the atmosphere of the culture so uh, if a company has not worked before with a research <coughs> group, of course they tend to see them quite often as consultants maybe yeah. or um, something like this so it's um i think a lot of effort has to go into establishing this relationship yeah. where we are this partnership but we have this this at eye level this partnership where both sides yeah. have to contribute and honesty right and honestly be, because oh, yeah. i mean if i have a company and a, and, a, and a researcher right comes to me and says i'm going to look at what you're doing and kind of fix your problems right i mean yeah. Not just like that, but, you know, mm -hmm. well, one reaction that most people have is we have to show the best side now because yeah, we're exactly. being evaluated, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. the whole point is they need to expose everything yeah. and trust us enough to, to be able to, because if I don't get exposed to the real nitty gritty, I cannot find the real problem, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the biggest problems, oh, sorry, one of the biggest um tasks we have initially is separating symptoms from actual challenges. Uh, we have a lot of defects in our products. Yeah, but that's generally a symptom of something. What's the problem, right? And it might turn out for four steps deeper that you find that, oh, it's, it's um, bad requirements, right? Mm. So the requirements process is not good. Well, and that process takes time and trust because we need to mm. penetrate it to objectively be able to see this. Mm. And, and this requires time. So building up a relationship with the company yeah. takes years. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but of course, the good thing is you can reuse it, right? So about 70, 80% of the company partners we have 
we had long relationships bef before CERT. Mm -hmm. And then we always try to introduce a couple of new partners in the new projects so we get new blood and new challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say um, uh, Time People Group is an example of a re relatively new company partnership, which we're really happy about. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and, and uh, banking sector, for example, which we haven't worked with much, we work mostly with telecom, automotive, you know, embedded industry. But banks are a huge, huge yeah. software company, software, mm. right? Mm. But, but we haven't worked much with them. So there we're establishing and building the relationship. Mm. Um, and that's part of the equation, I would say. It's, yeah. it's not easy, but it's kind of fun, though. <laughs> exactly. You mentioned banks. Are there any other industries you're looking to partner up with? Yeah. I mean, we have 12 partners today, um, and we are looking into uh, one of the partners is has been bought up, so they're phasing out, and we're introducing a new partner probably, which most people know about the company. I mean, I can't say it on, on a hot mic. Um, but we are constantly looking for, here's the cool thing, this new company we're going to work with and hopefully introduce in the project, we're already working with them informally, mm. right? They had a challenge, we had a problem solve solution to that challenge, they're trying out the solution and we've established a relationship. That's kind of the first step to kind of proof of concept and then we can kind of phase them into projects where they're more actively involved. Mm. And this is kind of how we don't, I don't want this situation where it's trust me. Of course, they should trust me and we should trust them, but that's not the basis. The basis is problem and solution and objective measurement of problems and solutions. And I think if you can try to get there, which is not easy, I think it's a better foundation because you don't have to prove trust, right? You, you, can, you can kind of have a mutual beneficial agreement, yeah. if you yeah. will. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question because I talk so much I forget your questions. <laughs> Sorry. Well, my next question is going to be this. Um, if uh, Hopefully we've created some interest uh, for our listeners here, for, for your research and your work. How would they go about uh, reaching out to you if they want to learn more or become a partner? What, what should be the course of action? It is a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. It's a seven-stage process. <laughs> no, uh, so, so, the, so I'm going to give you an example. I was invited as a key speaker at a conference discussing public tenderings, you know, when big government agencies buy big systems badly and waste billions of taxpayer money kind of thing. Uh, and I was invited to give them a speech on why this happens. And I told them why it happens. And they were very quiet in the room. So either I was completely wrong or I was completely correct, right? But I was very honest about it. And I basically said, these are the two reasons why it doesn't work. And it's a matter of education, competence, and courage. Mm. And I said this, and it was very quiet, very impolitically correct. Mm. And I would say there were 90 or 100 government agencies, public agencies there. Mm. And I would say I, I <clears throat> made 88 of them very angry. <clears throat> but two of them came to me after the presentation and said, this is exactly true. This is what happened for us. Mm -hmm. And I said, good, give me, a, give me a call. And we had two, two workshops discussing their challenges and what we're doing. And can they just take something we've already done? Mm. Then here you are, right? Mm. Uh, or do they have a problem they would like solve, which we are not working on? And they did. And then we basically formulated those problems. And I applied for funding for those problems and got the funding and other partners. So it starts with the conversation, an honest mm. conversation without mm. prestige. Mm. And, and you have to be brave. I'm not interested in working with politicians. Mm -hmm. Life is too short. And I'm not, not saying literal politicians as a, as a profession. I'm talking about where politics is more important than, uh, I don't know, pursuit of truth or mm. pursuit of betterment, mm. if you know what I mean. So I'm what? fine with being provocative to eliminate the people who are not mature enough or interested enough to actually solve problems mm -hmm. because it's very draining to kind of be politically correct in problem solutions. You need to identify the kernel of the problem and then you need to solve it, right? If you need three years to penetrate the problem, you never get anywhere. Mm. I so think we, we here's, here's a simple, yeah. sorry. I think 
we share that the problem with you as consultants i think that yeah. uh, you know it's a lot of like you mentioned a lot of prestige uh, you know you don't want to show your weaknesses and but that's why we're there you know we're hmm. there to help one small one low hanging fruit before we forget yeah <laughs> one low hanging fruit one easy way just to get at least in touch and get an overview of what we are currently doing yeah yeah good. maybe <laughs> good get an overview also about and we mentioned the seminars before the conferences we organize um is just to to check our website uh, rethought.se mm -hmm. uh where you can find an overview of the current partners some of the topics uh we are currently working on the, what we believe are pressing and uh lots of videos uh from talks we are giving uh and i think the simplest form is just to drop us an email yeah i mean literally literally yeah. just send us send any of us an email saying hey yeah. We're these people, let's take a cup of coffee. And we take a cup, cup of coffee over Zoom. Worst case scenario, nothing happens. And we, we talk for 45 minutes. Best case scenario, we find a kernel of something interesting to go forward with and we book a workshop. It's mm -hmm. our job kind of to, to, to do this, which means there's no cost really yeah. in addition to the time invested. Mm. And, and then of course, after the workshop, we kind of known, is this going to happen? Is yeah. it something relevant? And if it's not, thank you. If it is, right then we continue and and generally it doesn't take much more than two workshops or something until you have exactly. a good idea what we could focus on and many times here's the cool thing many times the problems companies or organizations have it's not just companies it's also public public organizations like like um, like any government agency right because they're also software companies if you look if you think about it right yeah. they either use software or they develop software or both mm. or, and, and and any service they deliver, like uh, for seconds, Kassan, right? When you go into their systems, that's literally software they buy or maintain or, or develop. So that's our business. Yeah. So the interesting thing here is that many of the challenges they have, we are already working on or have worked on, which means that even if we don't do something new together, there can be a transfer of stuff we already done to them and we're interested in that because then we get cases, right? The more organizations we work with, the more data we can collect about how good or bad our solutions are. Mm. So they get the solution to a problem and we get measurement if the solution works back. That's our payment. Mm. And this is a very attractive business model because mm. if it doesn't work, our data shows this and they don't have to buy it or use it. But if it works, they get objective, and I use that word carefully, yeah. data on that it works, which means they don't have to trust us or pay us. Mm. And that's kind of a really nice business model. It's kind of evidence-based solutions, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think, so just drop an email. It yeah. doesn't have to be more complicated than that. It might take a day or two before we answer <laughs> uh, because we, I get a lot of emails, but um, that's basically it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds easy enough. Rethought.se. We'll bring Rethought.se, yeah. Perfect. And you also, uh, you mentioned uh, some webinars. And uh, we're actually, we have a couple booked, Time People Group and you guys. Uh, we're recording this. We are in uh, the late October of 2021. And in November, we're going to have uh, three webinars with you guys. Uh, we're going we're gonna to invite the researchers to talk about their work. And then we're going to end with... Uh, like a roundtable panel discussion with with you guys are going to be there and the researchers, so we're very much looking forward to that. So I think that would be a great next step for our listeners just to sign up yeah. to the webinars. And if you're listening to this recording later, the rec uh, the webinars will have been recorded themselves, so you will find them at our website or on YouTube. Yep, um, I think that's a good point. So we're literally uh, taking three of the the many sub projects and directions we have. And there are three uh, researchers presenting their current work. Yeah. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one is on scaling agile mm -hmm. uh, and how do you kind of scale agile in communication and coordination and remove unnecessary layers, right? In this coordination communication, which I think is very interesting. Like yeah. uh, you have a tendency to kind of put layers on like, oh, now we're doing agile. So you put the agile layer on an old organization, right? Mm. And you kind of just build complexity and size. And then all of a sudden you have like 15 documents and 19 meetings. Mm. Well, yeah, but you should have one meeting, right? Mm. So how do you do this in live in reality in a big company? So that's one direction. Okay. 
another direction. It's a very interesting it, subject because I think uh, a lot of our customers are really struggling with, ex ex you know, the bigger ex expanding and, and scaling agile. So that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. And then you mentioned that tech, you, you were talking about technical depth earlier. Yeah, I don't like that word yeah, because it's misused. I, I see it as asset management. So asset management. think about it like this. Mm. When you're developing a product, right, the product and all the things around it, like test cases, design, documentation, code, everything is assets, right? It has a value. You've invested in it and it is, has a purpose. How do you manage those assets over time? How, how much can they become old and degrade? Mm. And what's the cost of that degradation? Like mm. you don't update your documentation, just an example, right? Mm -hmm. But what does that cost? Is that the problem? And that's generally used, the, the term for that is generally used as technical debt. The problem is debt kind of assumes that you should pay it back, but that's a too narrow perspective. You should rather think about it like this. What's okay to ignore and what is not okay to ignore long-term? And then technical debt is part of that, but only part. Mm. So, so think about it this long term, because most products you develop last a very long time in one way or form or another, right? You might rebrand it, restructure it, you reuse it, right? Mm -hmm. But how do you manage all the stuff around it and not just the code? And this is a big, big thing if you want to be competitive, because it's one thing that you'd invest in development of the product or service. But the real costs comes every day when you ha have it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's kind of the perspective, how you do this in a reasonable way. Mm. Uh, and that's everything from human parts to really technical measurement parts, right? Um, so that's one. And the last topic is... Continuous like, everything. Continuous everything, continuous yeah. Everything. So, sensible, or we like to phrase it, sensible automation. I yeah. Maybe. So, so basically, how do you, how do you, in a development cycle, achieve a good continuous row of deliveries? Hmm. I mean, it's a lot of hype. The latest hype is continuous, right? Continuous integration and delivery, right? That's kind of the new hype words, right? Hmm. Uh, but the idea has been around for a very long time. So the question is, how fast should you be? What's the actual cost and benefit of doing this? Because most people kind of look at the development organization and say, ah, the, you know, we do continuous engineering here. Yeah, but what's the point of continuous engineering? Well, the point is continuous feedback from customers to improve your product. Well, what most people miss is how do you then collect that data and include it in the decisions for what to do in the product? Mm. And so it's, if you do continuous engineering, it's actually transforming the entire company, not only the development, mm. which means... How do you measure the investment of that, the cost of doing that for the entire organization versus the value? Mm. Uh, so we're working on a maturity model for figuring out where you are and how far you need to go, but also a return on investment model. What should you focus on in terms, and what are the bottlenecks? You can have a perfectly aligned process and organization, and then there are two bottlenecks that basically make all the investments of the rest meaningless. Uh, and I think that's also a very interesting seminar. Yeah. And yeah, all of these agree. seminars, and I'm proud of this, just want to end with that. All of these three seminars, right, which are really cool, I don't present and he doesn't present. That's our team and our younger team members. And that's really cool. Mm. That's the point of all of this, mm. right? Mm. Hiring smarter people than me and you, and doing stuff without us having to do it, but rather we work as a team. And, and I'm very proud of that, that three team members who are younger than us do I think this. so too. Yeah. Just creating an environment where they can yeah. develop. Yeah, fantastic. And I think, like you mentioned, the webinar, webinar subjects are really interesting. And I think it's perfect in this day and age that we are in now. I think it's very uh, actual. So I think it's uh, perfect. And uh, I think we're going to end on that. I think we're going to say uh, as uh, to our listeners that if you're interested in these webinars, go to olingo.se or timepeoplegroup.com to register. And I will um, say a big thank you to Tony and Daniel for, for being part of the podcast. Uh, I would thank, you. thank you for having us. Back on. Maybe we could do a, a deep dive into more of the research, but it's been great to getting to know you guys and, and the great work that you're doing. 
Um, so if uh, do you have any have any last uh, message to our audience uh, before we leave? No, don't trust us. Don't trust us. <laughs> look at the look at the seminars and and invite and invite the researchers mm. and see what happens. I, I would say that's a better proof yeah. of anything we do, right? Instead of me trying to convince people of anything to the point, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Same page. And I think that's what we want, right? Um, uh, and yeah, this is it. Thank you very much for having Thank us. you a lot. Thank you so much and thank Great. you for listening. Och där säger jag ett stort tack till Tony Gorsik och Daniel Mendes som var våra gäster idag för deras intressanta spaningar och det de delade med sig kring deras arbete på Blekinge Tekniska Högskola. De nämnde ju de här kommande webbinaren, tre stycken tillfällen här under november 2021. Så att ni som är intresserade av det, ni går in på olingo.se, där kan ni läsa mer och anmäla er. Är det så att du lyssnar i efterhand och känner att jäklar, det här borde jag ha varit med på. Var inte orolig, de här webbinarierna kommer att finnas inspelade på Olingos Youtube. Så gå gärna in och titta där, det finns redan nu ett helt bibliotek med intressanta webbinarier som vi bjuder på. Och sen så vill jag då också slå ett slag för rethought.se som alltså är hemsidan för Blekinge Tekniska Högskola och deras CERT-projekt som vi pratade om idag. Så stort tack för att du har lyssnat och på återseende.